Good evening. Good evening and welcome to our Sunday evening lecture series. My name is Susan Engel and I direct the adult division in the Center for Adult Life and Learning and happy Mother's Day to those of you who may be mothers in the audience. Before I introduce tonight's program, I want to inform you about some upcoming events we have in, for our June program that I'm sure you won't want to miss. Ted Koppel, Jesse Norman, Letty Cotton Pogrebin, Patricia Ireland, Peter Mayle, Henry Louis Gates, and Linda Fairstein are just a few of our upcoming guests. And now for tonight, the topic being that of our guest's most recent book, Blood Sport, the truth behind the scandals in the Clinton White House. Um, our guest will be speaking and then afterwards we'll entertain your questions following um, his talk. There will be a book selling and signing outside this hall. And now I'm delighted to welcome back to our stage a gifted writer whose reporting on often controversial issues is always informing and enlightening and reflects the highest standards of journalistic excellence. He became very well known when he wrote his national bestseller, Den of Thieves, and is currently a contributor to the New Yorker magazine and editor-at-large for Smart Money magazine. He was also page one editor of the Wall Street Journal. He is the recipient of the 1988 Pulitzer Prize for the Wall Street Journal, articles on the 1987 stock market crash and the insider trading scandal. And he's also um, the winner of a 1988 George Polk Award and the 1987 and 1988 Gerald Loeb Awards. Many of you may know that he's also a graduate of Harvard Law School. And prior to jo joining the journal in 1983, he was executive editor of American Lawyer Magazine, a good friend of the 92nd Street Y, Mr. James Stewart. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining me on Mother's Day. If there are any mothers, happy Mother's Day. Um, it is nice to be back at the 92nd Street Y. It feels like coming home, especially after a um, fairly intense book tour, which seems to be de rigueur these days when you write a book. Uh, I've recently been asked, what question am I most often asked on the book tour? And the answer is, can I summarize my book in one or two sentences? <laughs> The answer to that question, honestly, is no. So I appreciate having the opportunity to talk about it in a little bit more than one or two sentences with you this evening. It was just a little over two years ago when I was working at my office at 57th and Broadway and I, the phone rang and it was Susan Thomas on the other end of the line, somewhat breathless, saying that she had something that she couldn't talk about on the phone that she needed to come in and visit me in the office. I knew Susan Thomas only very slightly. I don't think I had seen her in more than 10 years, going back to the days when I was working in American Lawyer and she was managing partner of Wilkie Farr here in New York. And like many lawyers who call me from time to time, I sort of assumed that she had a client who wanted to get some kind of story in the magazine or newspaper and was hoping that, that I would be the one to write it. I have to say my experience in these situations is not very encouraging that while the lawyers often think, or the clients more to the point, think these would be wonderful stories, they rarely turn out to be. But I'd like to have an open door policy, so I said, of course, come on over, and she did. Well, this, as you know, did not turn out to be just a magazine story. She immediately plunged into a discussion of the Clintons in the White House. I was a bit taken by surprise. I hadn't recalled how close Susan Thomas was to the Clintons. I knew she had been involved in the transition, she had worked on the campaign, but this was now um, 1994, uh, well into the administration, and I hadn't realized that she had remained such an active advisor, spending, I believe, at least one day a week in Washington talking to the Clintons. But in any event, she described in fascinating detail a White House, and the Clintons in particular, besieged by allegations involving the Whitewater scandal, which just didn't seem to go away, the death of Vincent Foster, where new conspiracy theories seem to be spawned on a daily basis, and then most recently, a spate of publicity involving sensational allegations by Paula Jones. And she said that somewhat at their wit's end, the Clintons had decided the only way to put these scandals behind them was to demonstrate they had nothing to hide by opening themselves up to a reputable journalist. 
And Susan began to describe various qualities they were looking for in this journalist, somebody who had no known partisan leanings, who wasn't affiliated with any major news organization and thus would feel committed to defend reporting that had already been done. Uh, somebody who understood business and financial subjects, somebody who had a national reputation and thus would command attention for the work. And they never, she never actually used my name or said that I was the one that they had decided on, but I could see the universe shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until pretty soon I realized that as far as I could tell, I was the only one that at least to some extent fit all of those qualities. And when I asked Susan if that were the case, she seemed delighted that I might undertake this project. <laughs> Well, I don't know if you've ever had days like this, but when Susan Thomas has left my office after about an hour, I knew somehow my life was never going to be the same again. And a few weeks after that, I traveled to Washington. Originally, I, I was going to meet both the President and the First Lady, but in the event, I met only Mrs. Clinton in the map room of the White House. And I was very excited by this. Uh, I was trying to maintain my cool to, to say, well, this is just another reporting project after all their subjects and sources like anyone else but I'd never even been in the White House even on the tourist tour and so being led across the Rose Garden and into the basement of the White House and seeing the scurry of the business of state going on all about me it was very exciting I was made only a tiny bit deflated when my moment came to go into the room and meet Mrs. Clinton and I saw that another journalist was leaving Bob Woodward <laughs> <laughs> So I realized I wasn't the only journalist getting to see the First Lady, but I figured, well, if it had to be another journalist, it might as well be Bob Woodward. I was in good company. And we had about an hour and a half conversation. I want to dwell on it in some length so that you understand the sort of the frame of mind that, to which I began this project. Um, I found that Mrs. Clinton to be very attractive, very articulate, very vital, more attractive really than I had sensed from television appearances or from photographs. And we had um, quite a long discussion, which she was, she was very animated and obviously spoke with considerable passion about the coverage that she and her husband had received since coming to the White House. And um, I stressed in all of this that I would be independent uh, taking on this work and that I felt that that was not only in my interest, I had my reputation as a journalist to consider, but it was certainly in her and the President's interest as well. Because after all, if I was not independent, then the resulting work would not have the credibility that I uh, thought they were looking for. And she seemed to readily agree with this. Looking back on it now, I only, I only sense a few peculiar aspects of it. Um, Mrs. Clinton did seem, uh, in my view, a little bit naive about the press coverage they had received. I remember her speaking to me somewhat heatedly, saying that she could not understand why, when she, as the First Lady, made a statement, the press and others simply did not accept this as being the truth, that they would greet it with skepticism, even scorn, and they would go out and double-check it and trying to find people to contradict it, and they would even accept the word of someone like Paula Jones over her when she had insisted nothing like this ever took place. Nonetheless, reputable news organizations would print the allegations of someone like a Paula Jones. Well, it did occur to me that the days when the media accepted the pronouncements of presidents or first ladies without question, if they ever existed, have long passed. And I think quite understandably, given the sorry record of public statements that have been made by the Clinton's predecessors in the White House. And furthermore, I felt that it was a little naive to expect the press to accept pronouncements by the President of the First Lady, especially as to events where they were not necessarily present. For however sincere Mrs. Clinton was in saying that nothing of the Paula Jones type encounter ever occurred, she, after all, by her own admission, wasn't there. And Paula Jones, whatever her credibility was, naturally the press will at least listen and in many cases print allegations of that nature. But that aside, when I con concluded the interview, I had the sense that she seemed quite enthusiastic about this prospect. I know I did tell her, I tried to warn her of a few of the pitfalls, and I said, I do think it's in everyone's interest that you think through these now rather than later, that it wouldn't be in your interest and it wouldn't be in mine if we go down this road and I plunge into this work only to have you change your mind and decide that this was all a mistake. I also said, you know, you're likely to incur the resentment of the Washington Press Corps if suddenly you bestow this very uh, treasured and valuable access on me, who is not only not a member of the Washington Press Corps, but comes from New York. 
<laughs> and she said, well, it can't get any worse than it is now. I certainly don't care about that. Um, I'm not sure she would agree with that today. And it was with that that I then went back to New York. Uh, I later was asked to meet with George Stephanopoulos on behalf of the president. We had further conversations about this. And then I kind of sat back waiting for some indication from them as to how these meetings had gone. And then nothing transpired. I did talk to Susan Thomas periodically, and she said, well, the president's having trouble making up his mind. That became a common refrain. At one point, I was asked uh, to write a memo for the first lady because I was told that she was going to be writing a memo for the president. And I said, well, don't they just talk about these things at Camp David or wherever they go? And I said, well, no, no, the, the president only really focuses if he has something in writing in front of him. And I was told that such a memo was prepared and that point one was that they might as well do this with someone like me because otherwise another writer would do it, possibly someone who was actively hostile, hostile towards them. But there was still no decision. And finally, I called back to the White House and said, well, the more I think about this, really, the more uncomfortable I am with the idea that I would even be waiting for your permission to begin this work, that after all, I don't wait for other permissions from the subjects of stories to launch a project. And perhaps it would be, in fact, easier for all of us if I simply made the decision to go ahead. But will I have your cooperation? And again, that suggestion seemed to be met enthusiastically, at least in the First Lady's office. Maggie Williams called me back to say, by all means, I should begin work, that the First Lady would cooperate. And while they couldn't speak for the president, they felt sure that he would get on the bandwagon once the project was underway. Well, looking back on it now, I guess I would call that the high point of our experience together. <laughs> because as you probably know by now, none of this so-called cooperation ever materialized. I was never given any explanation. I was never told, in fact, that there had been any specific change of heart. No one from the White House called to say, um, don't do this or we're not going to cooperate. Um, no one even said no to my interview requests. I would simply make them. There'd be vague promises that, well, maybe after this foreign trip or maybe after this vacation, whatever, the meetings would take place. But then they never did. And even I, who was very optimistic about this, about a year into this, began to despair that there would ever be the kind of cooperation I had originally hoped for. But I tried very, uh, tried very hard not to hold this against the Clintons, that while I was, of course, disappointed that the historic meetings, the fantasy weekends at Camp David, where I would be taking down history in the making, were not going to take place, I nonetheless respect their right, as I do anyone I cover, to choose not to talk. After all, I think the First Amendment protects silence as much as it protects speech. And um, I tried to make sure, and I hope, that this book that resulted is pretty much the book that would have resulted even had I had much of the co cooperation that was promised. Of course, without the Clintons, I did have to find other sources. Um, I think in the beginning, had I realized they were not going to cooperate, I might have panicked having agreed to do this book, thinking that, that without them I might not have been able to create a story. But nevertheless, as so often the case, I did find many others close to the Clintons, formerly close to the Clintons, or living in Arkansas, involved in this story, who were willing to tell their stories. And particularly, I found two of the most fascinating characters I've run into in my reporting career, Jim and Susan McDougall, who you've probably seen recently on trial in Little Rock. Now, a few critics have questioned my reliance on the McDougals. And I sometimes read these articles and wonder what the critics think have happened, as if the McDougals were like thrusting themselves upon me to tell their story. In fact, that isn't how it happened at all. Both McDougals were quite elusive, particularly Susan. Uh, and it took months and months of pursuing them before I could even get my foot in the door and ultimately persuade them to participate. I'll never forget my first meeting with Jim McDougal. I had flown to Little Rock, which by the way, if any of you have ever gone to Little Rock, you'll discover that the airfare is, you could take about three round trip t uh, trips to Rome for what it costs to go to Little Rock. I got to Little Rock and I had spoken to Jim on the telephone and he wanted me to meet him at a convenience store just, just off the interstate and gas station that ran by Arkadelphia, Arkansas. So at the appointed time, I showed up in my rented car. I parked outside the convenience store. 
you know, trucks are roaring by on the highway, and lo and behold, there's no Jim McDougal. You can imagine what it's like, having come all the way from New York, parked in this car, this godforsaken parking lot, and the subject of the interview has not shown up. Well, I put my anxiety behind me, and about 20 minutes late, he did appear, and it was the trademark Jim McDougal. He was very well-dressed in a double-breasted wool, navy, pinstripe suit, a very smart hat, tie, suspenders, and off we went to Jim McDougal's favorite restaurant, the Western Sizzlin. <laughs> now, bear in mind that Jim McDougal, as he was eagerly telling me in the car as we went over there, had, had suffered a, um, a heart attack, a seizure, he'd had open heart surgery, and he was supposedly on a strict diet. <laughs> he was even worried, he was telling me, that he would never survive a trial. <clears throat> so we got to the Western Sizzlin. This is the kind of restaurant where you first you order whatever kind of steak you want, and it's kind of fried on these open hot hot um, stoves behind the counter, and then you help yourself from side dishes on the sort of buffet counter. It's one of the few places where I have found chocolate pudding on the salad bar. <laughs> so McDougal came through the line, heaping his plate, macaroni and cheese, fried potatoes, <laughs> rolls with butter and the steak, and proudly told me that he ate there every day at 11.30 in the morning. <clears throat> I was worried we weren't going to get through the interview. <laughs> well, that was the beginning of many conversations with Jim McDougall. Um, he, he told me a tremendous amount eventually, although he did tell me that he suffered from uh, alleged memory loss. And some people have, again, faulted me for uh, believing things that Jim McDougall had to say when he has acknowledged the memory loss. But to be honest, the only thing I've really doubted about Jim McDougall is this memory loss. I couldn't help but notice that the memory loss always covered the most contentious periods of time when the most um, troublesome behavior seemed to have taken place, including most of the events for which he's on trial in, um, in Little Rock. And in the end, I didn't actually rely on J Jim McDougall all that much. There were plenty of other people who knew him very well, and much of what he did say was corroborated by documents. And you may have noticed that on on trial and under oath, he did repeat one of his more interesting tales, which was the story of how Bill Clinton jogged over to his office one day, sat down on a new leather chair that J Susan had just given him uh, for his birthday and proceeded to sweat on it as he suggested that he send some business to Hillary at the Rose Firm. Now, that remains in dispute, and you know, I suppose people could, could differ about what really happened in that particular meeting. But the very first time I heard it, it had the ring of truth to me. Um, I don't think anyone would have fantasized a story about Bill Clinton sweating on a new chair, which indeed had just been given to him by his wife, Susan, uh, if, that's what he, if he was trying to make up a story to embarrass the president. Susan McDougall had moved to California, and um, again, just to indicate how difficult this is sometimes, it had been very hard reaching Susan. I finally did. She was always on the move. She'd have one phone number, then it would change. She'd be staying with a friend in Nashville. She'd be here, she'd be there. Anyway, finally I tracked her down at her brother's house in California, and she agreed to come out. Now, this is a very common uh, trait I've found in people in Arkansas, but they're very reluctant to make appointments. They just say, well, just come on by, you know. Come on down, just come on by, just drop in, I'll be there. Which for somebody from New York makes you, makes you very nervous. So Susan said, well, just come on, you know, just call me when you get to Los Angeles. I'll be there. I said, well, can't we make a time and place? She said, no, no, just call me at my brother's house. I'll be here. So sure enough, I went all the way to California, all the way to Los Angeles, and I called, and Susan wasn't there. And in fact, Susan wasn't going to be there at all for the entire week. So that trip was essentially completely wasted. I came back to New York again, panicking that this would never turn into a book. And about a month later, I got Susan on the phone. I will say she did seem very apologetic about the fact that I had to go all the way to California and had missed meeting her. But I can assure you it was a very happy day when about a month later, I again went to California. She would not make a specific appointment again, but this time when I called, she did answer. And I was thrilled when she walked into the lobby of my hotel and we sat down for a meeting. And that turned out to go wonderfully well and began a very close relationship in which she confided a great deal of information. Again, though, it was never entirely relying on Susan McDougall. 
uh, much of what she turned, told me turned out to be corroborated in numerous documents that eventually surfaced, some of which I reproduced in the appendix to the book. And it is very reassuring when somebody has simply narrated from memory a fairly long and detailed saga, and you later find random corroboration in various documents that, that the uh, source wouldn't have any way of knowing whether they existed or not, whether they would or would not corroborate their story. And it gave me a considerable confidence that she had, in fact, been um, candid and thorough and accurate in her recollection. I want to go into just two of the big mysteries that, in fact, interested me this story in the beginning. Um, Mrs. Clinton, in our meeting, asked me at one point, why does this story keep dogging us? Why will this not go away? Why does the media keep pursuing us? And I said, well, I said, you have a dead body in the White House, and you have files removed under cloak of darkness, either that night or the next night or whenever they were removed. Those are the elements of a classic mystery story. The public loves a mystery, the media loves a mystery, and it's not going to go away until the mystery is solved. So one of the things that I tried to do was to solve some of these mysteries, at least muster as much evidence as there is. And um, one of them that intrigued me from the beginning was, you know, what really happened in the Whitewater story? And I guess even more significantly, how did it happen and why did it happen? Why were people like the Clintons involved in a real estate deal with someone like Jim McDougall? And more interestingly, why did they stay in it? One of the things I discovered simply in putting things together in chronological order was that the investment in Whitewater occurred in 1978, the very same year that Mrs. Clinton plunged into the commodities futures trading. And much to my surprise, nobody had drawn that connection before. They had been treated as completely separate stories. So I began asking questions about, well, what was happening in 1978 that would have motivated uh, the Clintons, and particularly Mrs. Clinton, to embark on some very speculative investments, even by the standards of the um, uh, forthcoming 80s? And I did, that is where I got into, I think, some of the most interesting material in the book, which uh, I think shed a lot of light on the state of mind, particularly of, of Hillary Clinton, in 1978. This was a time when, by her own admission, their marriage was very troubled. She wasn't sure that she could count on the marriage surviving. Meanwhile, she herself had given up the potential of a very lucrative and successful professional career to move to Arkansas. She would have been starting from scratch in the event that she had to create her own life apart from Bill Clinton. And even if she did remain married to Bill Clinton, he showed absolutely no interest in making money. In a, what apparently is an Arkansas tradition, he didn't even carry his wallet or pocket change on the campaign trail, always relying on others to pick up the tabs for whatever was spent. And they would go to these investment meetings. Hillary would occasionally try to prod him into going to an investment advisor. And the investment advisor told me that Bill would ramble on and on about various political developments in the state, which always left them kind of scratching their head about, well, what did this have to do with anybody's investments? So I don't think it's surprising that Mrs. Clinton at this point felt that the burden was going to be on her, particularly once she knew she was pregnant and was going to have to provide for a child. I think in some ways this makes it all, all in a way more sympathetic, although it is a part of the story that they have not wanted to call any attention to. And it was a result of that that she embarked on both the commodities trading and the whitewater investment. Now both of them share a quality which I think again is quite common historically in Arkansas and in some ways even less common with the Clintons. After all, um, I don't mean to single out Arkansas. I think people there are, are uh, in many cases, they're wonderful people and honest people. But it does have a somewhat unique political culture, which was pretty much a one-party system with very little scrutiny. And I love the story I was told that um, former Governor Orville Faubus had bought a $400,000 house when he retired from his $10,000 a year job as governor. And a reporter asked him, well, how he could afford that house on that salary. And he said, well, I, I was thrifty. <laughs> <laughs> but there is an expectation down there that if you're in public office and you're underpaid, that others will make the money for you. And both of these investments had that characteristic. In the case of the commodities trading, it was essentially Jim Blair, a close friend of the Clintons who worked for Tyson Foods, who was going to make that money. And in Whitewater, it was supposed to be Jim McDougall who would make the money for them. 
Now, Whitewater turned out to be a particularly unfortunate and ill-fated investment, one that had any research been done would have been perfectly obvious from the beginning. No one, not Jim McDougall and certainly not the Clintons, ever bothered to consult the public records to see what the previous owners of Whitewater had paid for the same land. Had they done that, they would have learned that the people selling the land to them had closed on the purchase of the land the same day they were selling it to the Clintons. The major difference is they were paying only half of what they were selling it to the Clintons for. I asked Jim McDougall about that, and he said, oh, that doesn't make any difference. It was a fair price anyway. But I think it would have had they been aware of that. They also borrowed 100% of the money, even though the bank had insisted that 10% of the down payment had to be their equity. McDougall simply said to Clinton, let's go over to this other bank. This was a pattern that would continue throughout the McDougall operations. They borrowed the down payment. They never disclosed this to the bank, and therefore it was a 100% leveraged deal. Now, they were going to try to flip it themselves, carving up the land and selling it at a profit. But Jim McDougall was now working for Clinton in the governor's administration, and they were having so much fun dealing with the highway commission and the banking laws and whatever that nobody got around to having it surveyed. And by then, the interest rates had gone up tremendously. The loans had to be renewed at ever higher interest rates. The recession came in, and nobody was interested in this scrub land in a remote corner of northwest Arkansas. It's probably surprising they ever got out of this deal with as few losses as they did. But as the, as the losses mounted and cash demands grew, McDougall simply stepped in, partly out of embarrassment and partly out of this Arkansas tradition, and paid the Clinton's expenses himself. And it was out of this that grew the pattern of, potent, of apparent conflicts of interest that I think have led to so many, so many problems today. I think uh, the Clinton's decision to stay in the investment says a lot also about uh, Hillary Clinton's state of mind. One of the surprising aspects of the story I discovered was that the McDougals offered the Clintons several opportunities to extricate themselves from this investment in a face-saving way. The McDougals agreed to take on the liabilities and the equity in return for the Clintons releasing their ownership interest. But the very first time this happened, Hillary Clinton in particular was indignant. Bill said, well, it's fine with me, just run it by Hillary. And Hillary said, no, you told me this was going to pay for Chelsea's college education, and I expect it to do that. Now, I've often wondered whether Bill Clinton seriously agreed that they would give it up, or whether this was not simply a pattern where he would tell someone what they wanted to hear and then turn the burden over to Hillary for taking care of actually resolving it. But in any event, I think there is, you do see certain qualities that have surfaced elsewhere in Mrs. Clinton. One is a very, very strong will and determination which has certainly proven quite effective in, in seeking and securing a position in the White House, but I think was perhaps misapplied in an ill-fated real estate development where all the willpower in the world was never going to turn this into a profitable investment. And secondly, in this and in other instances where she insisted on staying in the investment, you see very much the mind of the lawyer at work, where indeed it was the Clintons' right to remain in this investment if they chose. On the other hand, it is not always prudent to exercise all the rights that we happen to have. And I'm sure Mrs. Clinton has looked back and regretted the decision to remain in this investment many times. I don't think we'd be hearing anything about Whitewater today, and I wouldn't be talking about it and wouldn't have written the book, if Vince Foster hadn't died in the untimely and shocking way that he did in July of 1993. After all, Whitewater, after briefly surfacing in the campaign, pretty much disappeared as an issue. It was only with the mysterious death and then the revelation that Whitewater files had been taken out of his office that, as I said earlier, the elements of a mystery fell into the place and the press went into a feeding frenzy. I think some of the responsibility for this conspiracy theories and the, the in many cases, shocking allegations that grew out of this uh, do reside in a probably instinctive knee-jerk reaction to try to protect the Foster family and certainly to protect others in the White House by trying to minimize speculation about the causes of any depression that might have led to suicide. And so I was surprised to see that in the transcripts of the remarks in the day after his death to the White House staff, the thing that President Clinton emphasized most of all was that no one can ever understand why would someone commit suicide 
that, that is unfathomable and therefore no one should speculate about it and certainly no one should talk to the press. That of course was like King Canute trying to roll back the tide since speculation ensued at a wild and rapid rate. But the story of Vince Foster I think is very, very sad and it's from his experience that I chose the title from the book. Um, he gave a speech at the University of Arkansas in May before his death in which he made this statement. He said, I cannot make this point too strongly. There is no victory, no advantage, no fee, no favor which is worth even a blemish on your reputation for intellect and integrity. Now Vince Foster in his note said that he found that he was not made of the material required to work in Washington where destroying people was considered sport. But in fact, what you see in the story of Vince Foster is someone who came to Washington with the highest of hopes and ideals and determination to serve his country, but was inexorably drawn into compromising his own integrity. He did this in at least two ways, one more serious, I think, than the other. First of all, he was handling the Whitewater affairs. He was wrapping up the Whitewater investment. He was filling out its tax returns. And as his journals and notebooks make very clear, he was agonizing over how to deal with the tax treatment of the final sale of Whitewater back to Jim McDougall. And in the end, he chose an option that was calculated to minimize scrutiny. It was calculated to minimize IRS examination of the cost basis of the investment, and it was calculated to minimize press scrutiny. The only problem with it, it was the one option that was in fact factually completely false. And I think this weighed very heavily on someone like Vince Foster. And secondly, there was the travel office affair where he was very much enmeshed in the decision to hastily fire the travel office people, which I think everyone involved now considers uh, to be one of the most ill-considered moves in the Clinton administration. And while the story of that is spelled out in considerable detail in the book, the point I want to emphasize here is that he found himself in the untenable situation of having to lie and cover up himself to internal investigations of what had really happened primarily to protect his deteriorating relationship with the First Lady. He and David Watkins, who was the head of management who was also involved in the travel office affair, made a pact together that they would protect the First Lady and, and prevent her role in this from being disclosed, even to the point of misleading or lying to investigators. And when David Watkins gave his test testimony, um, Vince Foster came over to him and said, well, what did you say? And David Watkins answered, I fell on my sword. Well, Vince Foster was falling on his sword at the same time. And he was terrified, perhaps irrationally, but nonetheless, without, without any basis, that there were now going to be congressional hearings into the travel office affair, and he would be asked to explain, to testify under oath about the role of others in the White House. And he would be faced with the choice of either repeating the lie under oath, in fact, committing perjury, or implicating his, his boss, his client, Hillary Clinton, which was something he had vowed not to do. Now, I also learned that about a week before his death, Vince and his wife had gone to see the movie A Few Good Men, which perhaps some of you have seen at one time or another. But one evening, my research assistant and I, David Kirkpatrick, who happens to be here this evening, got a tape of the movie. And when I watched the relevant scenes, a chill went down my spine. Because in that movie, the, there's a character who is in a very similar situation to Vince Foster. He is, either has to lie to continue to protect his mentor uh, in a criminal investigation, or he's going to have to implicate that person. And faced with that choice, he takes a revolver, puts it in his mouth, and pulls the trigger. Now in the introduction to my book, you, you will discover, if you haven't already, that when the park police arrived at the Foster home and told Mrs. Foster that her husband was dead, her first question was, did he put it in his mouth? And in fact, Vince Foster did put a revolver in his mouth and kill himself in exactly the same way that the character did in the movie. And I feel sure that Mrs. Foster, recognizing that, asked that question in the way she did because she had a premonition that that movie had inspired his suicide. 
Well, you can tell from those remarks that I, in my own mind, have no doubt that Vince Foster did, in fact, commit suicide. I think a very interesting part of the story that I tell in considerable detail is how and why others have seen it to their advantage to try to make a tragic situation much, much worse. There is certainly a very committed group of people, some of them very sincere and well-intentioned, who are nonetheless convinced that there has been a conspiracy at the highest levels to cover up the murder of Vince Foster. But I, in fact, found the story to be chilling and tragic enough, as it really is, without the need for further embellishment. And because I chose that as the title, I do see it as a sad metaphor for the state of our political culture today. I have to agree with Vince Foster that in many respects, politics today is a blood sport, that destroying people in Washington is what he feared it would be. It was perhaps a particularly melodramatic that it ended up costing him his life. But as you read this story, you will see there are many, many other well-intentioned, good people whose careers were tarnished, whose reputations were tarnished, who have left Washington under a cloud. And it remains to be seen whether that phenomenon will reach to the highest office and to the president and the first lady themselves. I hope any, if there's any conclusion people draw from my book, and my style is to try to simply present the facts and let readers draw their own conclusions, but one that I found inescapable is that truth has been a casualty in the blood sport that is being waged in Washington. And one reason it has continued as it has is that there isn't sufficient respect for the truth across the political spectrum. I found this to be a nonpartisan condition in Washington where, and where people of all stripes seem to have embraced the notion that the ends justify the means. I hope, if nothing else, that there will be some politicians who read this book and recognize that telling the truth is not only the moral choice or the ethical choice. I'm not so naive as to expect appeals to those esoteric virtues would have any immediate effect. But we recognize that telling the truth is the expedient choice. And if the truth had been told all around, there would be none of these so-called scandals in the Clinton administration today. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Yes? Um, I, sir, am from Arkansas, <laughs> and I'm from an old, very large, and I will say just incidentally, uh, an old Republican family in Arkansas. I say that so that I'm not, won't be uh, accused of trying to whitewash Bubba and Hillary. Um, but frankly, um, your book, which I've read very carefully, and then all of the subsequent things that have, you know, every day I force myself to read what's going on with the McDougal trial and so on and so forth. And frankly, it evinces from me one great big yawn. <laughs> and my reason for saying that, and I, you implied it, is that's how things are done in Arkansas. <laughs> and it's people scratch each other's back and people, uh, you circumvent the proper authority and it's, it's just the way things are done. And you know, here I am in, you know, big old crooked New York now, and uh, uh, these things, you know, my gosh, don't they know any better? But it's just the way things are done. And Whitewater, no big deal, no big deal. And just two weeks ago, I was in Arkansas at the country club. On my right was my old aunt, who is a judge, and she was telling very openly and frankly, how she had manipulated this divorce case. She had no business being on the divorce case anyway because it was, uh, it, it, it was an obvious conflict of interest. But, you know, she was very proudly telling us how she manipulated it so it could help my cousin <laughs> on the other side of the family. On the other side of me was a cousin of mine who was telling me all about these things. And I said, but all of that's in violation of the antitrust laws. How do you get away with it? Oh, those antitrust laws, those are the things you all have up there. <laughs> <laughs> so you might want to come. Well, 
I guess my only comment would be, um, it, maybe it's a yawn to you since you're so familiar with it, but it certainly wasn't a yawn to me. And knowing these things in the abstract to me is never any substitute for seeing it in very concrete detail. And particularly, this isn't just about Arkansas, but how it has spilled on the national stage and become something that has real political costs and consequences. That is the story that I've, I've tried to uh, tell here. I'm interested to hear you're a Republican. I met a few Republicans in Arkansas, but whenever I scratched the surface, I learned that they have only become a Republican very recently, right. usually to get a federal appointment from a Republican official, or maybe to, because they wanted to run against an incumbent Democrat, and the only way to do it was to be, become a Republican. One thing that I found fascinating about Arkansas, as best I could tell, it was really a one-party state, no, even though it had the trap. You don't wrong. think that's true? That's completely wrong. The finest governor Arkansas ever had, and he was drunk most of the time, was Winthrop Rockefeller, <laughs> a Republican. <laughs> Plus the fact that Arkansas now has three Republican congressmen. Well, I'll defer to you on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Significance of firing of the travel agents at the White, at the White House. Uh, I, I understand Hillary did this. Uh, what I don't understand why she did it or what the significance. Why it's such a terrible thing that she did it. Well, the story of the travel office is told in in great detail in the book, and I hope the significance becomes clear there. Uh, it is, if for no other reason, significant because it was the, perhaps the main trigger that caused Vince Foster's depression, that and events directly related to it. And you have to understand the travel office and what happened to understand why Vince Foster uh, was so depressed and would have considered um, committing suicide. The travel office is not a scandal in and of its, its own right. I mean, I don't think anyone disagrees that the Clintons had the right under the law to fire the travel office employees for whatever reason they wanted. But I think a lot of the problem has been that it, it showed them in a very unflattering light. It was hasty. It was ill-considered. It was very unfair to the travel office people. They were being replaced with cronies of the Clintons, a cousin, a third cousin of the Clinton. That was being, they were being urged to do this by a close friend, Harry Thomason, who had a business interest in an air charter service that was going to benefit financially. It was messy and it was unattractive. And it certainly didn't convey the image that, in particular, Mrs. Clinton wanted to convey. And I think that this is a recurring pattern in this administration where, you know, I think back to that New York Times cover which had the picture of Hillary Clinton as St. Hillary. She holds herself to an impossibly high standard and seems loath to acknowledge any sort of human failings. Whereas this, as in many other instances, if the whole story had simply been acknowledged and, and gotten out of the way in the beginning, the, the travel office wouldn't have caused, wreaked the havoc that it has. Yes, there were some, some errors made in, in the travel office thing, and people make errors, and I think the American public and the voters can forgive things like that when they happen from time to time. We don't really expect perfection, but again, I think in this political culture, to acknowledge any weakness is to... I think people fear is to give the ammunition to the other side, which will then pillory you over it. So it's a, it's a complicated um, situation that I think nonetheless sheds a lot of light on what life in Washington is like today. I might ask your travel yes. I'm from Washington and uh, lived throughout that whole um, moment. Just so people here know, the travel office is not a political appointment position and the people in the travel office have been there throughout many administrations, both Republican and Democratic. And that firing in the, of the travel office caused um, great reverberations within the Washington community. And in fact, some of the stronger supporters of the travel office were in fact Democrats and led the charge both media uh, and politically, uh, in the media and then also politically, against that fi those firings. So um, these were people who had helped many administrations uh, set their agendas figure out their travel at the last minute and people felt very loyal to these folks so that was part of that was part of the issue that in fact democrats were angry with the clintons as well mm -hmm. um, i actually have point. a question for you though yes um, how do you uh foresee the impact of your book on the uh 96 elections do you expect that your book will uh, be brought up as we see the next several months unfold and uh the debates continue well well i didn't write the book to 
to have any particular effect on the election. I did, I did feel that this is information vote that I hope voters would have and might want to consider in reaching whatever conclusions they, they want about, about who to vote for. Um, but I'm not under any illusions that I think a book per se will, could transform an election, even if it was uh, something that I, that I wanted to do. Um, I nevertheless do, do feel that there are, there are two main issues, I think, for Clinton uh, lurking in all of this. One is whether there might actually be charges from the independent counsel, um, I think less likely against him, but more likely possibly against the first lady. That would turn the political equation you know, upside down, I think, and would be a very significant uh, development. And I don't, my book will have nothing per se to do with that, except to the extent that I think it helps explain why there is that risk. And I guess more broadly, I think the character question will be an issue. Um, I don't think Dole is likely to mention Whitewater by name or mention Vince Foster or any of these things. Um, but there are going to be a lot of allusions to that. And certainly in my book, I think, for better or worse, you get a lot of insights into the character of the Clintons and others involved in the story and that, that people might want to consider that. But the fact is probably, you know, there are 260 million people in the country or whatever, and, you know, if a teeny fraction of those read my book, you know, I'd be surprised. Yes? I want to follow up on that, what you were saying. I mean, there are those of the, us who feel that the alternative to Clinton, uh, Clinton at this time might be a reactionary movement, a new, a new, new Gingrich retrenchment of the welfare state that might hurt the poor, the elderly, and many other groups if Clinton is discredited in any way politically and the Republicans come into office. So haven't you looked at the larger question that many people more would be hurt if a conservative reaction wins in, in 1996? Well, that's something I occasionally think about myself, but it's, it's not really my role as a journalist um, to try to, in my view, suppress information or manipulate information for broader political ends. Um, I think that the information in my book is, is one of many, many factors that any voter would want to consider, including the, the issues that you're raising, um, and that no one would be voting one way or another simply because of my book. I believe very strongly as a journalist, and particularly in a democracy, that the more information and the more true information available to the public, good, bad, indifferent, the better and more informed our ultimate choices will be. And if this is an unflattering portrait of the Clintons, and nonetheless we still decide to vote for the Clintons, fine, at least we'll be doing it without illusions. I don't think in the end illusions and myths further uh, the workings of democracy. Yes? If you were able to revise history over this whole Whitewater scenario, what, what do you feel the, the Clintons could or should have done differently? I would have... Uh, if I was in the Clinton entourage, and they did get some advice quite similar to this, uh, as soon as Whitewater surfaced in the 1992 campaign, I would first of all have had my own people get to the bottom of it and get as much information as we possibly could about what really happened in Whitewater. And then I would have come out and, and gotten it all out, then and there. And I would have been scrupulously careful to be honest about it so that you know documents don't show up six months later that contradict something that was said at the time. And frankly, I'd like to see politicians be honest, you know, period, not only about Whitewater, but about anything else that surfaces in the campaign. I think there's a real hunger in the part of the American public for something like that. And one of the reasons that Colin Powell was very popular during the brief period when he was considering running was with the refreshing candor, he seemed to answer questions. He was willing to take positions that obviously alienated some people. He wasn't trying to be every, all things to all people. He was confronted with his, his wife taking some antidepressant, and he immediately acknowledged that, yes, you know, what do you want to make out of it? It went away. I would like to see that become, an, you know, a new standard in American politics. And I think if the Clintons had done that, that would have been the end of Whitewater. Yes? Um, in speaking about the travel office, the worst thing about that whole affair was that not so much that these people were fired, or that that was bad enough, but each president, I understand, has the option to do that. But that Billy Dale was referred to the FBI, that the Clintons used the FBI to persecute someone that they, who maybe was going to blow the whistle on them. And also, I don't know, see, I'm going to buy the book. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <because> I, <laughs> no, I haven't read it yet, but I respect you. I, 
I was here when you spoke about your other book, Den of Thebes, so I do respect your journalism. But that was, what, that was terrible. That was a, a symptom of a police state. When you, when you sick the FBI on someone because you don't like what they may say about you, that's very serious. And I've been a lifelong Democrat, but and also what, I don't know if you mentioned in your book about Larry Nichols in Arkansas, and what about Terry Reed and John Cummings' book, Clinton, Bush, and the CIA, the MENA airport there. Uh, since I haven't read the book, I don't know if you've touched on those things. I'm going through a kind of persecution myself now, which I can tell in great detail, because I have been very frank about politicians in New York City and other things that have happened. But I don't know if you can speak to what I said about what happened. Well, it's office. true that Billy, Billy Dale did suffer more than just uh, the impugning of his reputation because criminal charges were brought against him. He had to defend himself in a full-blown trial where he was acquitted um, in the end. Uh, and I think that was very, very difficult for him. Uh, any, as anyone knows, a criminal trial is very, uh, very disruptive. I do not really go into the Larry Nichols allegations of the Mean Airport thing. There is another big book by Terry Reed about all of that. I didn't find any link to Whitewater. It, it frankly took me all the time I had in two years to cover what is in the book. Um, so I leave that to, to others. Yes? What is really a sensitive matter, the, the death of Vincent Foster. Uh, it's, it's, it's clear to me as a psychologist that on the face of it, the predecessor conditions for, for suicide are are, are pretty well known, and there should be clusters of those: death of a parent, death of a child, uh, divorces, you know, things of that kind, uh, illnesses, or a biological condition. Um, were you happy? Were you satisfied with the explanations given for the suicide? That he was just depressed over, you know, some uh, some problem he had as as an adult man who who really that's not really an occasion for suicide in, in most uh, in the opinion of most psychologists. Well, I'm not a psychologist. Um, I, all I could say is I did, I, I don't know that I could say that suicide is ever a rational response to particular problems, but there was certainly, and I think you see in this story, uh, a, an enormous array of problems besetting him at the, at the time of his death, including um, despair about his marriage, uh, despair about his very close, once very close relationship with Hillary Clinton, and then what he, I believe, considered to be his compromised integrity after he had just said it was the most important thing in a man's life. Uh, so I certainly saw a cause for depression. Um, also, I'd be interested if, if you read the book, because I think lurking in his profile, he, he did seem to me, again, I'm not a psychologist, but he seemed to be extremely repressed, that he had virtually no one he could confide in, He'd ride to the office in complete silence with his partners. He came from a world where you couldn't acknowledge any, um, any problems. And uh, I suspect there are probably things that only he knows that contributed to this. But certainly, uh, I'm satisfied that it, it simply, to me, defies probability that you would have someone with that many problems who just happened to be murdered at the same time rather than committing suicide. I see. Not as much as I felt like I needed to. I think I felt, account. on some level, satisfied, you know, accepting of it mm -hmm. once, in a way that I wasn't when I began work on the book, but that once I had um, you know, dug, dug into that more thoroughly, that somehow it did resonate as, as plausible to me. Yes? Um, if you're satisfied with the uh, reasons for Vince Foster's suicide, what do you think the motive is for accuracy in media? keep, you know, running these uh, full-page ads in the Post and the Times saying that they think Vince Foster was murdered and that his body was moved into the park and stuff like that. What, what do you think their motivation is for doing this? Well, I think they would like to see, to see the Clintons implicated in it. They've, they've come very close to charging that Hillary Clinton is responsible for his murder. And, um, you know, we could talk about this for hours, but, you know, P Hillary Clinton has come on the stage at a time when there are people who both want to deify her and people who want to demonize her for reasons that you know, I think have nothing to do with Hillary Clinton herself, but how they feel about the role of women in society. And um, you'd have to ask them, but I think what they would like to see is, is the implosion of the Clinton administration and nothing less. And if they can you know, keep stirring up these murder conspiracy theories to do it, they will. Yes? Thank you. 
seem like police perjury, some tax law violations, and obstruction of justice would just come to mind. Well, uh, in Den of Thieves, I was comfortable saying people were guilty of crimes because in every case they had pleaded guilty to crimes or they had been convicted. Um, that is not the case here. I'm not a prosecutor. I'm not a judge. I'm not a jury. I think the limits of what I can do as a journalist is to try to show what happened as, th as thoroughly as I can. And I leave it to others to conclude um, what level of, of guilt should be assigned to that. But um, one reason I would be hesitant to do that is that in many cases we haven't really heard explanations from the Clintons on some of these matters. And um, I think at the very least we should wait, wait to hear that and let the, the legal process take its course before um, reaching any hard conclusions on a legal question of guilt or innocence. But I think, you know, were misstatements made? Yes. Were lies told? Yes. Were there questionable um, conduct that certainly skated awfully close to the law if it didn't step over it? Yes, I think there's a, you know, quite a broad range where, you know, readers can draw conclusions short of criminal guilt or innocence. Yes? I'm somewhat curious about the book writing process. When you undertook to write this book, did you do so in the hope that you might eventually have, uh, expend a considerable amount of time and, and money, it appears, in the hope that you might have a book that might find a publisher and get published, or had you already had a contract uh, with the publisher before you began the uh, endeavor? Well, fortunately or unfortunately, I already had a contract to do a different book with the publisher. So when the possibility of this book arose, I went to my publisher, Simon & Schuster, I went to my editor, and I said, here's the situation, this is what I'd like to do, can I turn away from the other project and can I do a contract to do this book? And they said yes. But I had committed myself contractually, which was one of the points I made both to Susan Thomas's and Hillary Clinton, that, you know, to please try to think this through early, because once I made the commitment and once I signed a contract to deliver a book, I felt I had taken on a responsibility that it wasn't, I couldn't just say, oh, well, forget it now, you know, we're not going to do it after spending six months, and that this is, after all, my livelihood and my profession. Uh, so I did have a contract. Um, you know, within the first few months after starting work on it to do the book. How much did it cost to actually do all the investigation and, and, and all these trips? <laughs> I haven't really added it all up, but I can tell you it is a tiny, tiny fraction of what the House and Senate committees have spent. <laughs> <laughs> and without being, um, I don't mean to be immodest, but I think they've come up with less information than's in my book. And that's in part thanks to my good research assistants. In fact, David, you wanted to stand up. This is David Kirkpatrick, who worked on the book with me. <laughs> yes? Feeling as you do that the more information the public gets, the better democracy is served. Do you also have a sense that there are limits to information we should get about the personal lives of public officials? <laughs> Well, my own view, my own personal view, is that um, I'm quite happy to stop my work at the bedroom door. That um, this story, of course, did give me occasion to ponder that very issue. And um, I've also talked to other journalists about questions like, well, when does the private life of a public figure become relevant? Is it if there's like one or two affairs, or if there's ten, or if it's compulsive, or what? My own view, and it's sort of because I don't know where to draw that line, is, is, to, is to really, you know, not go into the question of, of someone's uh, personal life. Now, in this story, you see that while I, 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 I wasn't, you know, interested in trying to find out what really happened in, in uh, some of these encounters. Collateral incidents, nonetheless, were inescapably part of the story, particularly trying to understand the state of mind of the troopers and why they spoke out as they did. But I tried to sort of honor that line. But that is never a standard I would impose on other, other members of the press. And one thing I've learned that in today's age, where there isn't an institutional media, I mean, there could, you couldn't get the editors of you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and you know, other mainstream newspapers. It wouldn't have any effect because there's so many other ways of disseminating information that if there's a hunger and an appetite for knowledge, somebody's going to provide it, whether it's in newsletters, on the internet, on, on talk radio shows. It gets out there. 
So I think we're, one thing that I think we've, we've seen in the Clinton administration is that the electorate is becoming somewhat more sophisticated about these things. It isn't so shocking to hear it, and, and many people, I think, have just decided it doesn't, it doesn't interest them or make a difference in their vote. That's a very dramatic change from as recently as 1988 when, uh, you know, allegations of um, marital infidelity derailed the Gary Hart campaign. Yes? I'm still a little puzzled as to why uh, the Clintons asked you to, or at least Mrs. Clinton initially, to come in and and uh, perhaps take the role that, uh, that you ultimately took when you, you have a reputation for, uh, for in-depth reporting and, and uh, for independence. And it's, it's not clear, was it mostly naivete on their part that they thought you'd somehow be their friend? And, and, and I mean, it, it's not, not at all clear. Well, might have well it's not clear to me. I mean, um, on the face of it, it made sense to me that if in fact they had nothing to hide, that this was unfair coverage, then I felt it, it, it was logical, it made sense. Now maybe it was only the President and Mrs. Clinton who knew that there were some embarrassing aspects of the story that were better left untouched, but they couldn't turn to their advisors, they couldn't say to Susan Thomas, oh, you know, we know Susan, we've told you that we have nothing to hide for all these years, but in fact we do have a few minor things to hide, so let's don't go down this road. I think that would have been too, created too much of a credibility gap with close associates, but I don't know, that's, that's pure speculation on, on my part. As I said, no one ever conveyed any explanation to me about why they did it in the first place or, in turn, why they decided not to. Yes? Who wrote primary <laughs> I don't know. I can tell you it wasn't me. Um, I somehow suspect that it might have been two people collaborating and that some of the people who have been able to deny being the author can do that because they're not the sole author. I think people should be asking, do you have a financial interest in primary callers, uh, not did you write it? Yes, in the back. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed your <coughs> remarks very much, and it strikes me that you have a great deal of courage to tackle personalities who inspire uh, sometimes very violent reactions. And I wondered, since the publication of your book, had you ever felt that you are in any kind of danger? Not really. I've always felt as a journalist that you're safe once you get the book out. <laughs> it's those few weeks leading up to it that I was, I'm always kind of looking over my shoulder. Um, I guess there was one, I did give a talk at a bookstore in Washington where there was one man who I thought was about to lunge at me and was, you know, veins were beginning to bulge from his neck and I was sort of relieved when the store personnel kind of like gently pulled him aside. <laughs> but apart from that, no. No, and, I, and you know, I, I have to say that sometimes people ask, well, does the kind of work I do make me cynical, writing about Wall Street in the 80s, you know, Washington in the 90s? Uh, the answer really is no. I, um, I think it's an amazingly fantastic country that there can, you know, somebody like me can go around in Den of Thieves. I wrote about maybe the richest person in America, who, if anybody could have bought justice, it was Michael Milken. In Bloodsport, I can write about the President of the United States. And I can say whatever the truth is, as I see it. And I think that's a, a great tribute to this country and something I've never felt threatened uh, in exercising those rights. Yes? Uh, speaking of uh, what you wrote about in the 80s and what you're writing about now, what's your next project? Uh, I don't know yet. I, I haven't even gotten the files put, put away uh, from, from Bloodsport. In fact, I've, I've got to get those um, 10 volumes uh, of the congressional hearing things off my desk, or I'm going to go. I'm going to go crazy. Obviously, I'm going to look for something, and, and I have learned that a good good idea is more than half the battle. Uh, so I want to be careful in deciding what to do next. Thank you all very much. Stuart for being with us tonight. Thank you all for coming. A reminder that um, there will be books available for sale right outside this hall and um, you will autograph them. So um, please join us and there are also refreshments here. Thanks. That's great. Should I go? Yeah. Yeah.